The Victorians were passionate collectors of ferns, and they built special houses to show them off. Harry took me to see the one he'd started. Fern these Peter, on their travels. Oh, now this is a group of ferns. You know, I, I have had a soft spot for these, and uh, to see them together as a collection. We've always grown a few ferns, of course, but... Ferns were just one of the many plants the Victorians collected. The stranger the specimen, the more the enthusiasts sought it. Owners vied with each other to be the first to possess a new species. With expanding trade routes in the 18th century, new plants began to make their appearance in Britain. Soon a trickle became a flood. From the forests of South America to the slopes of the Himalayas, the search for new species took on the mania of a gold rush. Once gathered, the plants had to survive the ravages of salt air and wind on the long voyage home. Many perished, Yet a journalist noted in 1842 that there are few ships that now arrive from the East Indies without carrying on their deck several cases of plants belonging to one or other of our chief nurserymen. Planting the new arrivals was often an act of faith for the head gardener. Well, I've always fancied having a yucca. I hope we see that one in due course, Flower, but uh, I don't think it, it will this coming year. Don't ask me what drives one on to plant things that you know you're jolly well not going to see flower or come to fruition for a long, long time, but there's something in, in gardeners and garden lovers that do do that sort of thing. Many plants, tender to the chill of a northern climate, owed their survival to the happy union of two materials, glass and cast iron. They gave birth to the heated glass house, as light within as in the open day. This is Joseph Paxton's grand conservatory at Chatsworth. It was so wide that when Queen Victoria came to see it, her carriage was able to drive straight through. These cathedrals of horticulture were the wonders of their age. Like the great palm house at Kew, they could soar to over 60 feet and admit the tallest oriental trees and the undisturbed flight of birds. Our stove house at Chiltern is, regrettably, of a more modest dimension. Well, this is the last two going in, David. Right. That's right, that's the right way up. They look so much better when they are put the right way up. Of course, they're very, very old. Over 100 years old, that's a sure thing. And this was the summer quarter, or the summer height yes. for the plants. And uh, this house, of course, would have been heated the whole of the year round, so there was always warmth through that pipe. In the morning and again in the afternoon, this would have been damped over and the steam coming up from the pipes afforded the natural atmospheric conditions in this type of house. Come the winter, then they could go right down onto the pipes to give them that extra warmth. Or if you've got tall plants that you were in, uh, wanting to force in here, they can be let down onto this other ledge. There was always beautiful plants to be seen in here, and of course it was kept so that it was an ornament to come and look at, and at the same time uh, there was rare and exotic plants to be taken from here, year in and year out, uh, to the mansion. It was a growing understanding of how to control glasshouse heating systems that gave the Victorians the chance to bring even temperamental species through the British winter. These improvements allowed hot water to flow by gravity around a complex of pipes. 
This gave the gardener control over the temperatures throughout the glasshouse range. But the stoke hole was one of the garden staff's least pleasant workplaces. I was at one establishment where the boilers never went out, fruit houses or plant houses, year in and year out. It was around the clock. And there again, uh, great skill in managing that boiler uh, had to be got used to. If they said they just wanted to come in in the morning and feel there was a warmth in the pipe, they meant exactly what they said. And if they said the house should stand at 60, 65, they looked on the thermometer and they expected it to be there and those pipes just like that. And the opposite story, of course, uh, came in the winter. You had to keep the temperature up to what they said. And that was just as difficult as keeping the other way round. And uh, the time you'd done your training, you'd been through the mill, you, you were pretty experienced of, of keeping the fire at that happy medium. Although sometimes with the, the gas fumes and that from the coke and the anthracite, it wasn't very pleasant. The demand for plants came from three main sources. Scientific institutions like the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew, wealthy private collectors, and a growing number of commercial nurseries. This is Veach's nursery in Chelsea, one of the largest of its day. Here plants brought back by its own staff would recuperate, be propagated, and their progeny sold to enthusiasts. A begonia, a palm and a grevillea lead the procession of exotic plants into the newly restored stove house. That's right, David. Yours comes in here. When you put your hand on them, you could feel that there was heat there. And yet, to all intents and purposes, there was not enough heat to really make any difference. But it did make a difference. It kept botrytis and dampness and that sort of thing out of the house. The graceful roofs of the new glass houses were designed to allow in as much light as possible. Their curvilinear form paralleled the sun's path throughout the day. Many plants came from the drenching forests of South America and it was thought that rainwater was an essential element in keeping them healthy. Soft, lime-free rainwater was certainly advantageous to one group of plants. Their odd habits held a singular fascination for the Victorians. Well, we've got a small collection of uh, insectivorous plants here, pitcher plants, uh, flycatchers, whatever you like to call them. Uh, they're really bulk plants because uh, I understood there was two things they will not tolerate. One is getting dry and the other is having any other than rainwater or acid conditions. Their behaviour intrigued scientists like Charles Darwin. He conducted a number of experiments, including feeding them with raw meat and cheese. 
He was trying to find out why they needed animal protein. He concluded that their boggy habitat was deficient in essential nitrogen. Consuming flies made up for that. They're fascinating. This is the cruel streak in me. Fascinating to see the insects get trapped in them and devoured by them. The insects caught in them, of course, is, is their means of nitrogen supply. Some of them can become quite revolting when the tube starts to get filled up with these poor dead insects. The uh, flycatcher here, I was surprised at times the size of the insect that it caught. Once the head gardener acquired a plant, he had first to ensure its survival, then to learn how to grow it to perfection. The fine foliaged plants, which became fashionable in the 1870s, were particularly demanding, as they were cultivated for the colour and beauty of their leaves. Gardeners quickly ascribed a particular technique of propagation to each plant. Begonia rex had a method all of its own. You make the cuttings on the, the ribs and the underside of the leaf. And I like to put a slanting cut on about an inch, an inch and a half of the stem. Uh, wherever you make the cut, that callus is over and in due course forms a little nubble, something like a sweet pea seed. And it's from that in due course which the young plantlet comes. And I just push that stem into the compost and then the leaf lays completely flat and a few stones is put on it just to keep the leaf uh, in contact with the uh, compass surface. Otherwise, they are apt to curl up and they come off of the compass and uh, they don't root quite so easy. Little went to waste in a garden, and the clay pots that got broken provided useful drainage for pot plants. Crushing them into tiny pieces was an arm-aching task. A purpose-built crop grinder made the job a little easier. Hard work though it was, it did produce a pile of fine dust, just the material prescribed for a potting compost. They like a nice bit of fibrous loam, which I've got and added a little peat to, and uh, the brick dust helps to keep the compost open or rich, sweet and durable, which was a phrase that the old gardeners used in days gone by. This is the begonia rex leaves, which we inserted uh, into the box of propagating compost and placed in this propagator. They are now ready to be severed from the, the parent leaf and potted up. The leaves can stop here and they will produce a second crop. They are just beginning to come in the incisions we made in the leaf. I'm very pleased with them.
But not all flowers grown on the big estates were recent arrivals. Primulas had been cultivated for many years. One in particular had reached perfection as Queen Victoria ascended the throne, the exquisitely proportioned auricula. This alpine flower had been domesticated by wealthy Viennese in the 16th century. In Britain, it was adopted by the Lancashire textile weavers. Working in their cottages, they had time to nurture it. However, I found a reminder of its popularity in a somewhat grander house in Derbyshire. When the National Trust took over Cork Abbey in 1985, they found a house full of treasures left untouched for more than half a century. But for those of us interested in garden history, the treasures and the mysteries lie outside, and there's one in the walled garden. This is an auricular theatre, tucked into the corner of the garden. It was built by the estate carpenter in 1857 to provide a showcase for the owner's collection. So we've filled the staging with old varieties of show auricula, and we've put them against a black background, just like they used to. And in the front here, they used to hang curtains to protect the delicate flowers against driving rain and too bright sun. John Loudon's Gardening Encyclopedia shows an auricular theatre. It's simpler in construction, but with one sophisticated suggestion. It describes putting mirrors at both ends. The effect will be very pleasing by apparently lengthening the stage each way, as far as the eye can reach. The auricular's theatrical splendour is soon over, but when they leave the limelight, they must not be forgotten. This is a summer plunge bed, and you would have found one of these on almost every old estate garden in days gone by. They were a very, very useful place for anything requiring cool, moist conditions. They usually had, as this is, a north-facing aspect, and they were usually made up in a box affair like this, or a frame, which was filled with, uh, as a rule, one-year-old leaf soil. Uh, leaf soil of that age keeps a lot of moisture in it, and uh, it's always cool. I think that uh, our little collection of auriculars and primulas will be very happy here. Not all the traffic in flowers was one way. The journalist who observed the boxes of plants arriving by ships commented that the same ships returned filled with the common flowers of England. They were destined for the colonies to be greeted with a rapturous welcome, as was this clump of primroses when it arrived in Melbourne.
As the days start to warm up, the time has come to put shading on the houses. Most favoured by the old gardeners was the slatted roller blind. David's made up a new roll built of materials from the local hardware shop. Putting up the blinds in spring was always a tricky business. Oh, that's a bit bad. That's the wrong way round, I'm afraid. <sighs> That's it. That's it. That looks right this time. They let in a different sort of light, even on a sunny day. They let beams of light in, but it doesn't cause any scorching. Yep. Oh, that's good. Don't let it down and come down with it. <laughs> Try not to. One of the snags with uh, roller blinds, of course, they were taken down in the autumn and uh, they were put back up again in the spring. It was a slow job and you had to keep your mind on your work or your foot went through the glass or your foot slipped off of the plank or your hand slipped off of the blind. There was many slips that you could make, all which, as a rule, <laughs> proved pretty fatal to the pane of glass underneath you. Whilst blinds were the best form of shading the glasshouse roof, the sides and sunny gable ends were painted with a whitewash called Summer Cloud. Sometimes gardeners used a homemade recipe of whitening and skimmed milk. I like to see it stippled on. It, uh, it looks better and uh, it seems to be right all, all round. Uh, I have seen it in days gone by and it, it is done a lot of times today. It's sprayed on. It doesn't look quite the same. Uh, on such a house as this, where the uh, woodwork has been painted with uh, white lead paint, it's not good to the paint and it, it's best to put it on and just miss the rabbit in bars, the wood bars. Roller blinds had the advantage over whitened panes that they could be rolled up in spells of dull weather. Given the English climate and the demands of some head gardeners, this could happen several times a day. But, as we were to find out, dull weather was not going to add to our work. Harry's marathon effort during the early months of the year has paid off. The herbaceous border starts to fill out and grow upwards.
One favourite background plant was the statuesque delphinium. This is Wendy, bred in the 1930s. It's the oldest we could find, as sadly none of the tall Victorian elatums have survived. Much to Harry's disappointment, the very year he attempts to fill a mixed border in one season turns out to be one of the driest on record. Despite an earlier shower, the grind of daily watering comes sooner than he had expected. Everything went well until uh, about the end of April. And then it was obvious that some of the items were suffering signs of drought. And uh, we had to start watering there and then. Well, I'd prayed all along that the summer we had would be a, a, a normal English summer with a few good thunderstorms and, and a few good wet dull days and a few nice sunny days uh, when we wanted to see the border at its full.